So we'll look at in this slide, in this lesson, what are different types of feed aids, which feed aids are put in the mold, which are put in the part, and then we'll look at the effect of feed aids on thermal gradient. And we we'll look at particularly things like chills, where we go a little more detail and see how we really make the chills more effective. Okay. And the feeder sleeves are applied on. And what is the ME of modulus extension factor we look at? To start with, let us again classify feed aids. You see feed aids put in the mold, which are called as mold feed aids. So you have a chill or a feeder sleeve or feeder cover or mold feed aids. You can also use part feed aids in the sense you are changing the part geometry. And two examples of that are padding and pinning or pins. These are part design changes. By combination of these tricks, we can I can control my direction of the okay. And within chills, you may have external chills or internal chills. And within sleeves or exothermic, uh, sorry, sleeves or covers, you can have either exothermic or uh, insulation. I'm showing you the cumulative effect of different feed aids on the same example, so that gives you a very good mental picture of how feed aids really work. So let me take this casting, which is almost like a flat, thick plate, except at one end it has a boss. So under the boss, I have a small hot spot. But I decided, let us say, to put a feeder on the left side. So the green line is showing me how the temperature is varying at different thermocouples towards the end of solidification. Obviously, when I pour the metal, all thermocouples will show point temperature. And four days after casting is poured, all of them will show room temperature. So the most interesting instant of time is when the hot spot is just solidifying, rest of casting is already cooled down, we see maximum differences in temperature in different thermocouples. So at this point, when the feeder hot spot is just solidifying, it is at that's the solidest temperature. Portion next to casting is slightly cooled down. On the other side, the thick boss is also somewhat high, not solid as but maybe a little bit of solid. So the by looking at the, the temperature line, you get an idea of not only temperature but also gradients in the mass. So where do you have a high gradient? You have very high gradient near the feeder. And on the other side, between the small hot spot of the casting and neighboring area, also you have some gradient. Now we start applying feed aid. First feed aid I apply is an insulating sleeve to the feeder. And you please observe carefully how the temperature gradients are changing. You watch the line first, and then look at what was done to get the line like that. Otherwise, you will miss the line. Okay. So watch the green line or temperature. So I'm going to apply now the insulating sleeve. What happened? The temperature in the feeder went up <coughs> compared to the rest of the casting. And because the temperature in the feeder went up, the gradient also went up near the feeder. So I'm now able to feed from the same feeder a longer distance into the same casting. Remember, whenever gradients are positive, I'm able to feed nicely. Gradients must be there. I want high gradients. So I'm able to now almost up to go up to the middle of the casting with this insulating sleeve. But that is not able to take care of my thoughts for the other end. That is still temperature has gone up. I want to keep bring it down. So what do I do? I apply a chill. What is a chill? It's a copper block or a steel block, which really increases the local heat transfer rate and thereby brings the temperature, relative temperature down with respect to the remaining part of the casting. It has come down, but it's still not down enough that it can, feeder can feed it properly. So I try one more trick to bring it down further. I apply pins in that portion. By applying pins, it has come down further, almost become flat. Remember, flat is not good enough for me. For feeding to take place, I need to have a gradient from feeder to the hot spot. So now I try one more trick. I fill up the middle part of the casting with a padding. So I'm basically increasing the thickness of the casting in the middle part. By doing that, the entire casting temperature has gone up. And so now my feed metal is able to perhaps go almost to the end. Remember this is an illustrative example just to show you the cumulative effect of all the feed aids. Actual percentage variation may be different in a real life cast. But this illustrates to you the different tricks okay, that the foundry man has. Obviously, they try to do minimum things first. Only put a chill or only put a insulating, if it works fine, it's good. Because part design change is always a painful thing. You either take a permission from the OEM or you have to machine the things and then supply it back with the additional cost. So you don't really want to put padding in things. Only as a last resort. Okay. So now let us look at the chills, which are one of the most commonly used 
uh, three days in the industry. <coughs> and as I mentioned, chills can be internal, in which case it gets fused like chaplets. Chills are thicker chaplets which get fused with the metal. Or you may have external chills of all kinds of shapes and sizes. And I want to now go into a nice discussion on how chills should be really designed. And how, how come some chills are effective, some chills are not effective, in what situation, we'll talk about. So we'll discuss three parameters of chills. First one is up to what distance the chills can be affected. Okay. And that depends really on the part metal itself. If you have iron casting or aluminum casting, depending on the conductivity of the part metal, people have noticed that in an aluminum casting chills are effective for a longer distance, but in a steel casting or iron casting chills are not effective for a long distance. Why? The answer lies in the thermal conductivity value of the metal itself, cast metal itself. Iron's K value is about 80, aluminum's K value is about 210 and that multiplication almost three times explains why in an aluminum casting chill is far more effective than a chill or iron casting. But that is only the first part. So please remember that in an iron casting don't expect a chill to be effective for more than about same time, same as your uh, thickness. If wall thickness is 20 millimeters, chill's effective area is only about 20 millimeters. Your 20 millimeters chill doesn't have any effect on it. Iron casting. Aluminum casting can go up to 50 millimeters also. Next, we look at the heat transfer rate. At what rate the chill is pulling heat from the casting? Okay. We feel that higher the rate, the better it is. Okay. So look at it. What does it depend on? It depends on the conductivity value of the chill material. The more the conductivity value of the chill, the higher will be the rate at which it transfers, takes the heat from the cast. So if you see the sand mold, the conductivity value is about 0.61 joules per meter Kelvin second. Let's say it is R. Okay. Iron chill, K value is 80, which is about more than 100 times the value for the sand mold. And if you see copper chill, it is 360, which means it is almost 400 times the sand mold. What I am talking about here is the rate at which the heat is being transferred from the cast to the chill. Now don't get unnecessarily you know, occupied with this parameter. Why? Because within the first milliseconds, the chill becomes so hot that it doesn't it stops taking heat from the metal. So this only means the first few milliseconds. It doesn't really mean how much heat is actually taking. The chill becomes very hot. So it looks promising on paper, but in practice it is not promising. So don't even worry about the K value of the chill. Why am I saying that? What really matters is actually how much heat is absorbed by the chill. So for a given volume, what is your question for heat uh, absorbed? It is, if you remember, MST or M specific heat into temperature difference. Okay. So if you look at, finally, if you, for a given volume, what matters is density and specific heat, right? Mass is nothing but density. The volume, so for a given volume, we look at density. So if you plot the values of density and specific heat for iron and copper and sand, surprise, surprise, you'll find that for iron, the value is 5.3 into 10 to the power 6 SI units here. For copper, it is 4.3 and for sand, it is 1.8, which means that your Iron and copper chills are almost equally effective and they also are only about twice the heat transfer capacity of a sand mold. Which means in a sense that don't expect miracles to happen by chills. Okay? Chills have extremely local effect and chills have only twice the heat they'll absorb as compared to sand mold. Okay? That's the lesson here. So don't try to solve big problems with, with chills. That's the big lesson here is don't overestimate the the effect of chills. Because chills add an additional parameter in the formula. The chill coating and chill placement and the, and the gap between chill and the part, all those things additional parameters which affect our casting consistency. So, so they said no, we don't try to, we try to minimize the effect of the use of chills. One second. If 5.3, what does it indicate? Yeah. It indicates the total amount of heat to be absorbed uh, by the chill body for a given volume. So because the chill, more heat will absorb. But it will only absorb, so if you say relative, you put a same volume of iron and copper chill. 
same volume. I'm not talking about weight here. Same size of iron chain or a or steel chain or a copper chain. Both of them will absorb almost equal amount of okay. And of course, this also depends on your how much area is in contact with the metal. Okay. One more point, Ashwin, yeah, I should say that. Good. What they say is, if you put a very small chain, it is as good as this. I think this must have heard many times in common. If you put a very small chain, it basically becomes saturated with heat. It becomes as hot as the metal or the mold around that. So it doesn't, for a heat transfer to take place, you must have a temperature difference. For temperature difference to have, the chill must be sufficiently, preferably long. You know, a flat chill versus a long chill. Long chill will be a little more effective because it's a highway to transmit heat. But it's not sufficient thickness. If it's not thick enough, it becomes, if it's very thin chill, it becomes as hot. Then once it becomes as hot as metal, it doesn't transmit it anymore. In, when you apply a feeder sleeve, insulating sleeve to the feeder, we talk about we are effectively increasing the modulus of the feeder. Right? And you say it increases by a factor called an MEF. And you say MEF value for insulating sleeve is 1.4 or something. And for exothermic sleeve is about 1.6 to 1.8, increasing the modulus. If you go back to our chill, the chill MEF value is typically about 0.3 to 0.5. What does it mean? It is effectively reducing the modulus of my cast. So I have a small hot spot, a small boss somewhere. And I don't want to put a feeder there. I want to put a chill there. I have the modulus of the hot spot area. I know the modulus of the neighboring area of the casting. Let's say modulus of the hot spot area is about 30% more than the neighboring thin area. I can bring it down to 30% by applying a chill. And once I know the modulus of the chill, modulus is finally a volume and surface area and all those things. If I calculate that, and then I don't know, I know that it is reducing by 30% from the previous equation. We said sand is 1.8, steel chill is 5.3, so it is about three times. So I know the modulus value of chill. Once I know modulus value, I assume some length by diameter by thickness ratios. Okay, now let me give examples of how these tricks work in real form. This is a turbine casing example, and you can see a small uh, porosity in the magnified view. Okay, and you can also see a corresponding island, yellow island, on that. Can you see that? A yellow island here, and then it is porosity. Okay, and that is because of if you can see the feeder is not able to feed the casting because of directional feed path is not available. And in this case, they will solve the problem simply by not even doing anything else, just putting a little inserting sleeve on the same size feeder. Now the gradients are increased. And with the increased gradient, it's able to feed through. That hot spot in the casting has disappeared. It gives you a good quality This is an example of applying a feeder inserting sleeve. Let's look at another example. This is a casting which was a railway's casting. And you can see there is a small island on the top, just below the feeder. This is a classical case of neck being undersized or oversized. When you see defects on both sides of the neck, that means neck is undersized. Now in this particular casting, there was a constraint. There was, there was a problem that they said we cannot increase the neck size. What do you do in that case? If you increase feeder size even more, it's not going to really help. So what they did finally in this case was they applied pins. It was a very innovative solution for this particular case. Is a case made by BHL, okay, and they put the fins. And these fins are very easy to break later on. The thin fin fins. With the thin fins, you see the hot spot in the casting has disappeared, and the feeder is able to take care of it. In fact, they can actually reduce the feeder size in this case and improve the yield also. You don't really need that, that big feeder for this. Okay. So one more example of a fin as a feed aid in the casting. And the third example we will show you is the padding, which I mentioned you, real life padding. You see that thin section in the casting at the bottom is not allowing the feed metal to pass through it and feed a hot spot which was next to that. So by slightly increasing the thickness there, which is referred to as a padding, part wall thickness increase of padding, the feed is now able to be a little more effective and the hot spot area is reduced. Okay. So we will see many more examples of these uh, feed aids in the industrial case studies. This was a starting or trailer for that. So what you learned in the feeding section in this particular lesson is feed aids can be of all kinds of types, mold feed aids as well as part feed aids. In the mold we are talking about chills, feeder uh, inserting sleeves and covers. And by part modification, like uh, what we are seeing just now, since and uh, padding. Okay. 
And remember, what they are doing essentially is they're changing the local heat transfer area of heat content. By doing that, they are manipulating the local modulus of the casting. And thereby, we are changing the pattern of direction of solidification of the casting and make it no more favorable to the casting. And please remember that most of the periods have an extremely local effect. So don't try to solve a problem in Pakistan by doing it in Bangladesh. Maybe it works, but here it doesn't work. You have to, a feed end will work only in a local, local area. Typically just twice or thrice the volume. Not more than that. Okay. And uh, remember when you have multiple feed aids, you have to wonder, worry about the cumulative effect of the feed aids. The first example which you have seen gives you that how different feed aids collectively solve the problem, the big problem. 